Well, as we get started this morning, I just want to take a few minutes and uh, just address a few things. Uh, as uh, you watched the news last week, as many of us were caught off guard, obviously, by tragedies in Nashville, I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that happens is we start asking why. We want to know why God would allow something like that and why he would allow something so evil, so wicked to happen. And as, as we, you know, haven't even recovered from that tragedy, then, then you know, you have weather and tornadoes. Um, over the last week, we've had weather strike multiple states from Arkansas through Indiana, destroying towns, destroying homes. And it's easy enough here in Grable, Indiana, for us to, to think about those places and, and to think about those tragedies happening some distant place. And then, and then it strikes closer to home, and we have our own destruction and people's homes destroyed two miles from here. Businesses destroyed, a church with a roof nearly ripped off. And every time one of these things happen, I, I, I hear my friends, I hear the people I talk to, my kids, they want to know, well, why would God do that? In fact, when we were sitting down at the table and we were talking about what happened on Friday evening, and we talked about, well, there were tornadoes, and because we all had to huddle in the bathroom and, and put pillows over everybody because we lived next door to the fire department and the siren was blazing and it's midnight and wake the kids up, run into the bathroom. And, and most of the time you think, well, it's just false alarm. And this time it just wasn't because, I mean, within a few miles, square miles of here, there's destruction, there's chaos. And the question comes, well, why? Why does God let that? And it's easy for us to get hung up on all the stuff that we don't know. It's easy for us to get hung up on tragic things and tragedy. And we need to remember, as hard as it can be in difficult circumstances, that God tells us, look, you're not going to understand every bad thing that happens, but I can tell you this, I work all things for the good of those who love me, who are called according to my purpose. All things work for the good of the one who loves God. And we trust that no matter what the circumstance is, God can work it, will work it for our good. We're his children. I would even argue this, that tragedy is not a time for the Christian to shrug and put their hands up as if we don't know what to do next, because we do. Every time tragedy happens, we know that that really gives us an opportunity to share the good news with people who are struck down. It gives us an opportunity to share it with people in the in the midst of hard times and difficulties, we can go to them and say, like, look, I can't, I can't explain what's happening to you. I can't explain the mysteries of God's providence and why he would bring natural disasters. I can't explain the mystery of God's providence and why he would allow wicked people to do wicked things. But I can tell you this, we have a good God who's faithful and righteous and just, and he loves you. And here's his message. He sent his only son who gave his life and died for you to purchase your forgiveness, to give you an eternal life. This is a great message that we have that we should take advantage of every single day, but even more so under persecution in times of tragedy and times of difficulty. And as I thought about that this last week, and even, even as I prayed through that this weekend, as we you know, saw different things happening in the news, I, I was reminded that you know, Jesus often said a lot of things that people confused or they didn't understand, or quite frankly, that most people didn't like. They didn't like Jesus and his message. They didn't like what he had to say. What do you think would be one of his most controversial things? If you had to just filter in your mind quickly, you know, you're, you're thinking through what Jesus said in the New Testament, what, what he's quoted saying in his, in his uh, sermons, in his, in his uh, teachings, what, what's something that stands out to you is, is like, well, that's something that would be controversial that people wouldn't believe or wouldn't, wouldn't understand. Uh, there's a whole bunch of, of options there. Let me tell you what I think. And I think it's actually kind of a trick question because I think this one seems so straightforward. It's not even hidden. It's, it's, it's point blank. Jesus says, I have come to seek and to save the lost. I think that was one of the most controversial things Jesus said. I think it's one of the things that was most misunderstood. I think it's still one of the things that's most misunderstood. Because if you're not a believer today and you hear the words, Jesus came to seek and save the lost, you really only have two options. You, you either believe it or you say, well, 
that's not true because I don't believe that Jesus came to save anybody. You don't believe in him at all. And even if you're a believer today and you hear the words, Jesus came to seek and save the lost, you, you might have one of two reactions as well. You might think, on the one hand, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm found. I don't need to be sought after. I'm, I'm good. I don't need Jesus to seek after me. That's, that's wrong. On the other hand, you might think, well, Jesus definitely says he came to seek and save the lost, but I don't know that he means that he really came to seek and save people as lost as me. Or maybe he didn't mean that he came to seek and save the really lost people. Now, we, we have a tendency to look through a lens of, of uh, something much smaller scale than what we, I think Jesus was really talking about, and it's often driven by pride that we kind of look at ourselves and think, well, I really wasn't that bad, and could Jesus potentially really save someone who was a murderer? Could he save someone who lived in sin their whole life, completely running away from him? Well, I think we have ample evidence in Scripture that that's the case. I think you could point directly to the Apostle Paul, who was a persecutor of the early Christians, a killer, a murderer. He was a party. And yet, on that road to Emmaus, that fateful day, he fell back at a great light and a sound of a voice that said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? It's me. I'm the Lord Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? Do we really believe that Jesus came to seek and save the lost? Do we really believe that, and likewise, that's our mission to seek and save the lost? To, to, to save them in a different way, Jesus gave us the gospel, he gave us his word to go out and seek and save the lost. Do you ever look at people and say, I don't know if they're able to be saved? I don't know if it's, it's possible to save them. Is it pride that stops us? Or do we just not understand the fullness and the totality of what Jesus means when he says, I really, really came to seek and save the lost? Uh, I, I watched a movie recently um, in theaters. It was quite the experience. Have you, have you seen Jesus Revolution yet? Anybody seen that yet? Just a few? Well, let me tell you, it, it, was, it was a great little movie, and it was about uh, Chuck Smith and Greg Laurie in the, in the 1960s and, and the, uh, the Jesus Revolution, I mean, by its title, and all of these young people and hippies and, and drug addicts and all these people were, were seeking something. And they crossed paths with a pastor in a small conservative church named Chuck Smith. And as Chuck began to interact with them, he saw that they really were seeking something. Now, not all of them knew what they were seeking after, and they were finding it in, in wrong places, but he, he started giving them the gospel and inviting them to be in his body with them and, and actually to come to their service, to come into their worship center. I will, I will tell you that when you start inviting different people into your body and you're completely open, it can sometimes ruffle feathers. And in that time, in that conservative little church, it ruffled feathers of people because they looked at these hippies and drug addicts and recovering alcoholics and people who just were young people and, and they didn't understand and they didn't dress right and they looked different. When they started coming in the church, people were upset. Now, in the movie, and I don't know if this is true, but in the movie, and I can certainly see this happening, one of their biggest complaints, all these young people seeking after something, they're, they're finding it in the message of the gospel. They're finding it. It's being preached to them, given to them, the gospel, forgiveness, freedom from your sin, a, a life lived for the Lord, all these, these one, and they're like, yes, we're, that's what we want. We're seeking after Jesus. That's what we want. And in spite of all that, the, the people in the, in the body still didn't want them coming around, and their complaint was, well, the carpet's getting dirty because they don't wear shoes. They're barefooted. Now, if you've seen the movie, you know that, and, and again, I don't know if this is maybe just creative, artistic, you know, delivery of the message, but, but the pastor, Chuck, hears this, you know, oh, the complaint is not that we have this sudden influx of young people who are desiring to hear the message of the gospel, which is obviously a powerful work of the Holy Spirit in their life. And we're, con we're concerned that the carpet's going to get dirty. So the next service, there's a line going out the door of the church all the way down the street up the sidewalk, and one of the you know, conservative, and I don't mean conservative in a bad way, but one of the guys who was angry about the carpet is walking in, and he's just, what on earth is going on here? And there he sees the pastor sitting at the doorway of the church with a bowl and a towel, and he's washing their feet before they go in and sit down. Now, I, I tell you what, that's, that sounds a lot like a picture of what Jesus would do when sinners turn and come to him. 
So do we really believe that when Jesus says, I am here to seek and to save the lost, do we really, really believe it? Or do we fall into the prideful trap of maybe thinking, well, how lost, Jesus? What are we talking about here? Are we talking about dirty feet lost, or are we talking about cleaned up, clean shoes, ready to go lost? Are we talking about people who, who, who they, they hear the message, but they stand on the outside and, and they work on their attitude, they work on their, their language, you know, they can't come in church cussing, Lord forbid, they'll, they'll be kicked out. No, I'm not saying just go ahead and start cussing. I'm just saying if you do, you can still be saved. There's grace for you as well. Well, in Jesus' day, this was something similar. This kind of thing was happening. In fact, the scribes and Pharisees were regularly and frequently upset that Jesus was associated with sin- sinners, or at least what they would call sinners. Today we're going to be looking at uh, really, really three parables. We're, this is our final message in the parable series. We've been walking through Jesus' teaching. Today we're going to be in Luke chapter 15. I started out, I was going to just try to focus on the prodigal son. I changed my mind I, because I see all three of these parables are so laced together. They're really a response to the complaints of the scribes and Pharisees. In the first couple of verses of the chapter, the scribes and Pharisees are grumbling, complaining about these sinful, dirty feet people who keep following Jesus around. And so Jesus gives them a response. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I hope, I hope that you do, and you, you join me in Luke chapter 15. We're going to read the first 24 verses here. Beginning in the, uh, chapter 15, verse 1. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Let's pray. Father, we have heard your word. You have spoken through this word to us this morning, God, and we hear it, and we just ask that you you teach it to us by the power of your Holy Spirit, God. Teach it to us. Plant it deep into our hearts. Help us to live. In Jesus' name, amen. These three interconnected parables 
a response to the kind of grumbling and complaining, the same type of thing that we still see so often today. We see it everywhere. We think about it. We even fall victim to it in our own lives, thinking that as we have sinned, I don't have any right to approach the throne of God because I'm just a sinner. And so responding to this, and, it, and it's hard to tell if, if the, the grumbling and complaining from the scribes and Pharisees, was it verbal? Were they out loud grumbling? Were they outright arguing? Was it Jesus understanding and knowing their hearts and thoughts that he dove into this? Either way, it really doesn't matter. Jesus knew what they were thinking as they witnessed these sinful people turning towards him. These sinful people who were living lives away from the Lord, and suddenly they were drawn to the message of Christ, and they were hearing him proclaim something new and different, that even you sinners, even you people who have messed up, even you can come, hear the message. You can repent and you can believe, and you'll be forgiven, even the worst of you. So I really want to ask us, as we look out and we see the world and we see the lost people of the world, what do we see? What do you see when you see lost people? Could you put in your mind and just imagine how you would describe someone who's lost? I think it's hard for us to do. I think the first person I picture when I think of a lost person is my own life, when I was lost, when I considered myself totally lost. I picture what I looked like there, and that's kind of what I apply I think in these three parables, as Jesus weaves them together, what he's really giving us is a picture of what he sees when he looks at the lost. The the complaint is, why would you let them come near you? And he's saying, you don't see the way I see. You don't think the way I think. You don't understand my mission because you can't see through this gospel-colored lens that I'm wearing. I'm seeing them differently. And the first thing he sees as he, as he begins this series of parables is he sees, when he looks at the lost, he sees a sheep in need of a shepherd. Verses 4 and 5, he asks them point blank, and something that they would understand being in, a, in, a, in an agriculture and in a farming type society, shepherds was a common trade at that point in time. What man having a hundred sheep? What man, if he's a shepherd, a good shepherd, not, not some just hired hand that's fixing fences. No, what shepherd, what man, if he has a sheep that's part of his livelihood, that's part of his life that he needs to care for, what man wouldn't leave the flock and go find that sheep when it had wandered off? What man wouldn't do that? Well, a man who didn't care about a sheep wouldn't. I think that's part of the point. But I also got to give you just fair warning. Sheep are not the smartest animals. In fact, sheep are both kind of defenseless and dumb. We're the sheep. I don't mean that in a mean way. We're sheep. At least spiritually speaking, when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to the things of salvation, we are, unfortunately, defenseless. In other words, we can't do it ourselves, and we're, we're dumb. In love, in love, we're dumb. I was reading some research in, in a book on actual shepherds who live currently in the Middle East, and, and they're, it's, this is this modern reading and writing, and, and they're talking about what it's like to be a shepherd in the wilderness even today. So this, this holds true from Jesus' time even today, and they describe exactly what Jesus is talking about here. Sometimes a sheep will wander off, and they're not smart enough to figure out their way back to the flock, and so a shepherd will, li- will have to leave and go find that sheep. And the other thing about sheep is because they're defenseless, they get themselves stuck somewhere. They, once they realize they're lost, this is what shepherds today are saying, they'll hide themselves in a bush or in a cave or under a rock, and they'll just sit there and they'll cry. Sitting there lost, away from the flock, away from the shepherd, and they just can't, they can do nothing but cry. Now, I don't know where you're at this morning, But I know some of you probably feel a lot like a lost sheep. And you're in a position where when you woke up, just just making the decision to come here with the flock of God's people was hard. It was hard to get out of bed. And there are seasons like that where it's just hard to do anything. Anybody ever done that before? Amen. Where it's just hard and, and you want to. It's not that the sheep doesn't want to be back with the flock. It's that you just, you feel lost, you feel stuck. 
You're defenseless. You don't know the way back. And so you sit there and you cry and you just cry and you just, you look around and you don't know what to do. This is why Jesus is such a good Savior. And I just kept playing that through my mind over and over this week. The the words that kept coming to my mind when I thought about these parables is, oh, what a Savior we have. Oh, what a Savior. Because what Jesus says here is he, he says, who wouldn't go after that sheep? You're complaining that the lost people are coming and being found, and I'm telling you that of course they are, because as, as we know John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Jesus seeks out the lost sheep. He runs to the lost sheep, and he rescues them. And just like it's described in the parable, when Jesus rescues us, we contribute nothing. We can't bring anything to the table. We bring nothing to this equation. We're lost sheep, crying, stuck in the wilderness. And Jesus, in spite of all the dangers, in spite of all the wolves, you know, David talked about when he was a shepherd, King David in the Old Testament said that he would fight regularly with lions and bears because the sheep are defenseless. And if that shepherd doesn't step in and protect them, they'll just be slaughtered. And Jesus runs after the one, and doesn't, doesn't get to you and then say, hey, get up, let's go, follow me back. No, 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 no. He runs after the one and looking at you in your state of just complete lostness, crying from your bed, crying from your car because you, you just can't imagine getting up and doing the next thing. And he doesn't leave you like that. What does the good shepherd do when he finds his lost sheep? But he picks the sheep up, and he puts them on his shoulders, and he carries them back to the flock. What shepherd wouldn't? That's a challenging question. Would we, would we be willing to seek out those who seem lost, who are, who are stuck, who are incapable of, of finding any way home, and they don't know what to do? Would we be willing to see them in their lostness and take them the message that Christ says, where he tells them, I will come to you. And if you will just look upon me, and if you will call me Savior, I will carry you. I'll put you on my shoulders, and I'll take care of you. Jesus goes after them. He's he's looking for them. He's seeking them to save them. He is the, the good shepherd, the great shepherd. And not only that, but Whereas the Pharisees and scribes looked at these sinners and they saw nothing but wickedness. There's nothing there. Jesus looks at at his children and he sees value. This is hard for us to to take in and comprehend that, that Jesus could actually look upon a lost person and see someone with value. There's a caveat though, and I want to explain this carefully. He uses this parable of a lost coin. The coin is lost in the dark of this woman's house. It's stuck in a corner somewhere. You can't be seen. It's covered with dirt. Now, how much value does a lost coin have? That's a trick question, right? It's kind of it's difficult to answer because we know that intrinsically, the coin doesn't, doesn't get lower in value. It's still worth a penny. It's still worth a quarter. However on its own, stuck, lost in the dark, in the corner, in the dirt, it's not worth anything. It's worth less because it needs to be in the hands of the owner. And in a similar way, we're like lost coins. We're children made in God's image. We're created in His image. We're created to be His. We're created to worship Him, to give our lives to Him. But when we're lost and we're stuck in the dark, and we're in the dirt and the muck and the, the, the dirtiness of life. Without the Savior, we're worthless. But He rescues us. And look what Jesus does. And John 1 describes this too. He comes into the world, into the darkness, and He shines a light into the dark. And to the dark places where the coin is buried in the dirt, He shines a light into the dark. 
And then he sweeps away the dust and the dirt, and he reaches down into the depths of the darkness, and he pulls the coin out, and he puts the coin in his hand, and he says, you do have value. You're my child. You're mine. You don't have value on your own away from me, but when you're in my hands, you have value because I have rescued you. Do you know how much you're valued by God? That he would send his only son to do what? To pay the price for you. My friends, if you're, if you're a Christian this morning, do you know how valuable you are to the Lord? He gave his only son. It cost him his life to rescue you. He has bought you for a price. The price was his son's blood. The price was his son's body, that he bore the wrath for you and took all of your suffering and took all of your pain and took all of the right wrath that you deserved upon himself. And how did he do it? Well, it starts because he seeks after the lost to save the lost. He sweeps away the dust. He shines light into the darkness, and he grabs you and takes hold of you. And then when he holds you and you realize that you are valuable to him, that you have a value, he says, look, not only have I pulled you from the darkness, but I'd, I'm not going to lose you ever again. I'm not going to let you fall back into darkness. I've got you. But sometimes when we're in the dark, we can't understand that. It's like because everything is so dark around us, this world can be so dark, this week was so dark and so difficult that we, we are looking into the darkness and we don't even realize that God is right there with us. We feel like, no, you don't understand, Jesus. I'm still in the dark. And he's saying, yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I'm here, but you're looking into the darkness. And I want you to look upon me. I want you to hear my word. I want you to turn your eyes to me. We sing it, turn your eyes to Jesus. We turn our eyes to the Lord. He is the light. But we get so wrapped into the darkness. We get so caught staring into the pitch black that as Jesus is right there with us the whole time, holding us, it's so easy to be focused into the blackness. And even at that rate, even in the darkness, when, we're, when, we, when we think we're lost, we're beyond saving, he says, no, I'm here, you're mine. Look to me. Look upon me. Open your eyes. And he tells a third parable. He tells a parable of a prodigal son. And when Jesus looks at the lost, he not only sees this, this sheep in need of a shepherd, he not only sees this, this, this person who actually has value that he's willing to to reach out and save, he sees a child who has run away. A child who has run. So might it be the case, might it be the case, that your cry out that, God, you're not with me here. You're not with me. It's not because God isn't really with you. It's because you have run from him. And you're sprinting headlong into darkness prodigal son is such a powerful picture of what our lives look like when we turn and run away from the Lord. Can anybody else relate to the prodigal son in a real, real way? This is the, this is the one where when I read the prodigal son, I'm like, oh man, I am, I'm, I'm pretty sure God was describing me here. I know I hadn't been born yet, but he thought about me when he wrote this. When he inspired these words, I was a prodigal. You know when I felt like I was a prodigal the most? And this is interesting, to say the least. I felt like the most prodigal years of my life were the four years right after I committed my life to Christ. July 2006, I walked down the aisle at the church into the baptismal. I was given new life, saved by grace, by our awesome Savior, and I spent four years trying to figure out how to walk in that, just absolutely devastated that I felt like I was walking alone. I, not many people know these stories. I went to college right after that, and, and to say the least, I did not enjoy it. Well, I made mistakes, just like many of us do. Mistakes that led me to, at different points in time, having to 
scrape together spare change to be able to buy food to eat. Mistakes that led me to sleeping in the trunk of a car. You put the seat down, you can lay in. I had just been saved. And within a year, I had my whole life just felt like I flipped everything upside down. What decisions had I made? I didn't feel like I was that bad. I didn't feel like I had done anything completely off, off kilter. But somehow, little bad choices and bad decisions had led to, I was living on people's couches, bouncing around. I, had no, I was practically homeless. I had nowhere to go. My future sister and brother-in-law, God bless them, they gave me space on their couch and I babysat for them so I could have food to eat. And then I'd, all, I, all I could think of was, well, I got to do something. I don't know what else to do. So I joined the military. Let me tell you, one of the best Christian environments to join is the military. I'm, I'm not, I'm being, I'm joking. It's not. It was terrifying. <laughs> know your audience, right? All the military guys are like, okay. <laughs> it wasn't just bad because I was in a, you know, I was a military firefighter. And I was 20. I was dumb. I showed up to boot camp, and this is no joke. I think the drill sergeants felt bad for me. Because as I got off the bus, and they're, they're yelling and screaming at everyone, and of course, everyone's in a hurry to try to file off the bus, and they're, and they're trying to grab all their bags and all their stuff, and all these people had things to get, and, and the drill sergeants just take your bags and just launch them, and just like go find it and get back in line. And it's this whole thing, and all this is happening, and I found myself off the bus, and everyone is scattered, like running and getting yelled at and screamed at, and I'm getting yelled at and screamed at, so they're like, hey, there's the footprints on the, on the floor. You gotta follow the footprints, stand on the footprints. So I walked to the footprints, I stood on the footprints, I'm in the front line of the footprints, out of nowhere. My first experience with the drill sergeant face-to-face was this guy who was way bigger than me and very scary. And he got, I mean, you know they have those hats, right? I mean, he got, like, my forehead was, like, I was getting banged with his hat because he was so close to my face, yelling and screaming at me. You know what he was yelling at me for? He said, where's your bag? Where's all your stuff? Go get your stuff. Get your bag. And I didn't know what to say because I'm like, I don't own anything. I didn't have anything. I didn't show up to boot camp with anything. I had a white t-shirt, a pair of jeans, and a, and a razor flip phone in my pocket. I didn't know what to do. I just, they <laughs> got it. <laughs> what should I do next, sir? I thought he was going to cry for me. I mean, I about broke his heart. I didn't have anything. Military was difficult for me. It was stressful. And I found myself so often, just like we did this last week, I found myself so often asking myself questions like, God, I don't understand. I just don't get it. This was in the heart of the war on terror. I mean, I have friends getting deployed. We have, we have fallen warrior movements every other week. When I got deployed, we, we broke the record, I think. We had a fallen, a fallen warrior movement is where someone gets killed in action and as they bring the soldiers home, when the, when the plane lands on, on, the, on the runway and it, and it taxis in to be refueled, we stand there at attention the whole time that they're on the ground. It's just a, a way of showing honor and, 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 and to be able to pray or whatever else that people would do during that time. But we stand there at attention the whole time the, the plane comes in, it taxis in, it gets refueled, it taxis back out, it flies away, and we're there standing on the attention the whole time. I'm not kidding when I say we went out for fallen warrior movements almost every single day that I was gone. Almost every single day. 2009, summer 2009. One of the deadliest years in Afghanistan that we had. Come home from that and tell me that you don't ever have questions. I just don't understand. And I was angry. I was angry, and I was angry at God. And and it was horrifying to me. Because I was asking questions like, God, I thought we were on good terms, and here I am, and I am so mad. And I lived with that anger and that frustration. And let me tell you where it got me. It got me nowhere really fast. And I can't explain what happened in my life other than to say I came to a point where I was, where I was 
making decisions and, and, and thinking things and, and frustrated and didn't know what to do. And it came to a point in my life where I just said, all right, you know what? Fine. Fine, God. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you everything. Because whatever I'm doing is not working. And so I'm going to give you everything I've got. And I'm going to pour everything I have into you. And, and you say I've got to lead my family. And I stink at leading my family. And for a while, this is going to be really, really awkward. But this is what you've demanded, so I'm doing it. I'm, I'm all in. I had never been so all in. And I was so sick of it. I give that, all that is the grace of God. All that is the Lord. You know, the prodigal son goes to his father. And he demands his inheritance, which is another way of saying Father, I wish you were dead, or Father, I'd rather you be dead because then I would at least have all your money that I can go run and do whatever I want with. And he runs away to a far land, and he squanders it with reckless living, stupid decisions, bad choices. And he finds himself sitting in a, in a, in a bog with pigs, which pigs were unclean animals to the Jewish people. And he was working for Gentile people, which was another no-no for the Jews. And he's there, and it's in the middle of that that he, it says that he comes to himself. He, he comes to his senses. Now, notice this. He comes to himself, and his first thought is, oh, you know, my, my, my father, at least, even his servants have it better than I do. It, I will just, at least I will go home and I'll tell him, like, God, I, Father, I have sinned against God. I've sinned against him. I've sinned against you. I don't deserve to be called your son, but I'm starving. I'm going to die. I'm going to die in this place. It's not worth it to die here away from you. I'd rather be a slave to you, and at least you would feed me. Now, that's, that's prodigal life. That's us being prodigal children. We have turned and fled from him, and he's Waiting, waiting for us. And his message of his love and his grace and his mercy, it's not forgotten. It's somewhere planted deep in our brains and our minds and our hearts. We know God loves me and God forgives me, but, but we're terrified of something. Something has terrified us. Something stops us from giving all of our life to him. I don't know what it was for me. And honestly, I don't know what it was that broke down that wall that gave me the faith to just step out and say, whatever, whatever I do, no matter where else I go, I'm just, I'm just going to give everything to God. What is it that stops us? Is it just fear? Is it the terror of, I've messed up so badly, I, I can't go back now? I think it's because we, we wonder if he'll have us. We wonder, will he receive me back? I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. I've got a story that I want to tell you that I heard, that I read recently, rather. There was a, a minister who boarded a train, and he sat down. And, and across from him, in those chairs that face each other, he looked across from him, and he saw a young man who was obviously nervous, anxious about something, doing that knee twitching, you know, deep in thought, something was wrong. And like any, any good person would do, especially this, this minister, he looks at the young man and he says, young man, I, I can see, I can see something's wrong. I can see that something's bothering you. Would it help you to talk? Would it, I'm, I'm here to listen if it would help you to talk. And the young man says, well, yes, actually, I think it would, I think it would help. I think it would be helpful. And the minister says, well, tell me what's going on. And he says, well, to be very honest, when I was younger, I got into a huge fallout with my parents. I, we disagreed over decisions for my life. I said things that were terrible. I said things that now I, I really realize I was, I was prideful. I was arrogant. I was foolish. I yelled at them. They yelled at me. We got into this huge fight, and I stormed out of the house. And when I left, I told them I was never coming back, and they said, fine. And then I heard, through mutual friends, I heard that my father was sick. I heard he had fallen ill, and he was not expected to live much longer. And I was convicted in my heart that I can't, I can't let my father die and not reconcile with him. I can't let him, I can't let him go and not, not see him. I, I, I can't do that. So I wrote my parents a letter. I said in this letter, I said, 
I think I was wrong when I was younger. I was foolish. I said hurtful things. And I, I want to come home and I want to see you. I don't want to live the rest of my life knowing that I didn't take this final opportunity to make things right. And then he says to the minister, I sent this letter, and in this letter what I told them was, I'm going to be on this train on this day. This train passes right by our backyard. In our backyard is a huge tree, and I, I just wrote to my parents, I said, if you, if you forgive me, and if, and if you're willing to have me come home, would just hang a handkerchief from one of the branches of the tree. And if you hang a handkerchief from the branch of the tree, as the train passes by, I'll see it, and I'll stop at the next station, and I'll get off, and I'll come right home. And if you don't hang it from the tree, I'll pass by, and I'll continue on. And then he finished by saying, our house is around the next bend. And I'm so nervous. I'm so scared. I, I don't know if I can even look out the window to see. I, I, I just, I don't think I can look. And so the minister says, okay, what about this? How about, how about you, you just bow your head and I'll, I'll pray and I will look and, and I'll let you know. And the young man says, okay, that's, I can do that. And so the young man, he bows his head and the minister walks over and, and just places his hand on his shoulder and just begins to pray, God, please, please, please. And he looks out the window and they start to come around the corner and, and, the, and the minister starts praying deeply, God, please. And the, just the tears are streaming down his face and he looks out the window and then out of nowhere with just joyous praise, he grabs the man and he says, look, look out the window. And they look and covering the entire tree, every sheet, every blanket, every pillowcase, every napkin, every handkerchief, every sheet and thing that the people had in their house, they had hung from every branch of the tree limb in a way to say, son, we love you. Come home. Come home. And they, they shouted for joy on the train and they cried and they held each other. And my friends, that is what God is calling to you this morning. He's calling to you, and he's hung every sheet on every branch to say, I love you. I love you. Would you come home? Would you come home? My friends, we're going we're gonna to sing this final song this morning. And I want you to know, I want you to know, no matter how far away you've gone, no matter how far away you've walked, no matter how dark the place is that you've been, no matter how long you've been laying under the rock crying, he is the good shepherd. And he rescues the sheep. And he searches for the lost coin. And just as the father embraces the son, it says he sees him from a long way off. And he runs to him. And he grabs him. And no matter what the sun says, it doesn't even matter. Father, I've, I've sinned against you. I, I, I know. Kill the fatted goat. Kill, bring me the robe. Put the ring on his finger. We're going to celebrate. It's the one thing that ties all three of these together over and over and over again. Every time a lost person repents and turns to the Lord, they celebrate over and over. They celebrate with joy. They, they go and they gather their neighbors and they celebrate. Look, I found my sheep that was lost. Look, I found my coin. Look, my son, he's returned. He was dead and now he's alive. He's alive from death to life. At Crossview, we say it like this. We want to see people awakened to life in Jesus Christ. And if you are a prodigal this morning or a sheep or a coin and you're not experiencing life in Christ, I want to invite you this morning. In fact, I want to call you this morning to come alive in Christ. In Ezekiel chapter 37, God tells the prophet, as he stands before a valley of dry bones, he tells the prophet, I want you to call them to life, call them to living, knowing that I can do anything and I can save anyone. That's his mission, to 
to seek and to save the lost. This morning as we sing, I want to invite you. And I know that it's scary to get invitations at church. I know that it's scary to to stand up out of your seat, to walk forward, to to, to give someone else an insight into your life, to, 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 to ask for God. But we're here to pray with, for one another. And I would ask you, maybe this morning you're not making a a first-time commitment to the Lord. Maybe this morning you're making a recommitment to the Lord, like I had. And you've committed your life, but you're saying, but God, I really haven't given you my life because I've been holding back. I want to invite you to come receive prayer this morning so we can pray with you. If you are making a first commitment, I want to invite you to come forward. In fact, if you're not making a first commitment, but you're praying for someone who should be or someone that you know that, that, that can, maybe they're here, maybe they're not, I want you to please come forward and pray. My band teacher in high school used to say, if one person does it, it feels weird. If the whole body of Christ in unison together worships and prays, and we all come forward to wrap our arms around each other, and we give each other hope and encouragement and you can you can just feel the life flowing through this place we'll have some leaders around if you want to pray with someone but even if you don't want that I I just want to invite you please let go of whatever's holding you back the pride the the misunderstanding the, the sin that you've walked in let go Just give your life. That's what he wants. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning. We are here to worship you, God. And now as we enter a time of worship and praise and prayer, I want to lift up every person here that needs to hear this, that you have come to seek and save the lost. And you're still seeking and you're still saving, even to this very day. You are our hope our righteousness. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen.